Good evening, everyone. Um, so first, let's have a, a very brief review of uh, what we learned last week. Uh, last week, we started to study uh, random variables. So first, let's, rec uh, let's recall what is a random variable. A random variable is just a function that assigns uh, a real number to each outcome in a sample space. Right, so when we talk about a random variable, you need to first think of uh, a random experiment. And this, uh, uh, so then uh, when you do this uh, uh, experiment, then, uh, wait, wait, give me a second. Then, uh, so each time you will, you will see an outcome. And uh, based on this outcome, uh, this uh, random variable will have a value, right? And uh, why we are so interested in uh, random variables? Because uh, um, a lot of times, um, what we are really interested in would be some numerical ex uh, aspects of outcomes. So for example, if we think of the uh, Tom and Jerry uh, gambling example we discussed last week, actually uh, Tom would just be interested in whether he will win or lose, right? So whether, so the, 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 the gain would be $1 or minus $1. So because of this, uh, it, is, uh, it is necessary to introduce the notion uh, of uh, Run variables. Then, uh, how do we? And actually, uh, we need to study. We can classify uh, random variables into two different classes: uh, discrete random variables and uh, continuous random variables. So, what are the difference uh, between them? Uh, discrete random variables is defined like this. If a random variable can take at most countably many different values, then it is called a uh, discrete random variable, right? So uh, countably many means uh, so a set of numbers that can be listed as the first one, second one, and so on, right? And uh, uh, what is a continuous random variable? Continuous runnable variable can uh, can take uncountably many different values. So, and because uh, uh, the set is so large that the probability that this runnable variable takes takes any specific value would would be zero. So in this case, so the such a runnable variable would be called a continuous runnable variable. Uh, we just discussed uh, discrete runnable variable last week. Uh, hard to describe the distribution of the discrete random variable. The, the idea would be straightforward. Because uh, this random variable can take at most probably many different values, we just need to list the probability at each specific value. Right? So then we have, uh, we have the probability mass function of this uh, discrete random variable. And uh, so we just use this uh, PMF to, to describe the uh, distribution of a discrete random variable. And uh, um, what is that? So as I said, it is just stands for the probability that this x takes any specific value, lowercase x. And it satisfies certain uh, conditions. So for example, for each uh, real number, this lowercase x, because uh, this p of x stands for a probability, so then uh, it must be bigger or equal to zero. And if we think of all possible values this random variable can take, and, and we take a summation over all such possible values, then so this, uh, this sum must be equal to one. And uh, uh, there's another way to describe the, the distribution function, uh, uh, to, to, to describe the distribution 
author and a verbal, so which is called cumulative distribution function. The definition of that is like this. So we use this capital F for the probability that the lemon verbal uh, takes a value less than or equal to this lowercase x. So this is the, the value of uh, f of x. And uh, why we are interested in this uh, CDF? Because uh, as I explained last week, so this uh, CDF could be a more powerful tool to describe the distributional behavior of random variables. Why is so? Because uh, so for continuous random variables, they don't have PMF. So, uh, but for whatever random variables, they must have CDFs. So that's why it is more powerful because uh, it's a more general. It, it's a tool for more general random variables. And the uh, last time, we'll also discuss how to uh, convert a PMF to a CDF, how to convert CDFs to PMFs, and so on, right? And uh, I think it's uh, uh, pretty straightforward. And be uh, before, we, before, before we begin to study uh, the next topic, maybe I think... Uh, I would like to uh, show you something because uh, so there there were a few students asking me about this uh, this question. So maybe I think I I, I, I I may take some time to explain that. So uh, I think some of you asked me uh, how to understand independence between two events using a Venn diagram, right? So, actually, it is not, uh, it is to represent independence using Venn diagram. Actually, it is not as uh, straightforward as, uh, say, two disjoint events and so on. But we can still do that. So, maybe, uh, let, me, let me give you an example so that you can, you can understand this. So uh, suppose this big rectangle is the entire sample space. So that's the capital M, right? And uh, uh, for our convenience, we just assume the, the width of this uh, rectangle is 1. OK? So then uh, suppose that we are interested in a event A, and also we organize the outcomes within the sample space so that when we draw the event A, so this A is just a, this blue rectangle. It is also a rectangle, right? So this, uh, but this rectangle has a width of A. So here, we, we use the area to represent the probability. So because uh, the width of the, the big rectangle is 1, and the width of a, uh, event A is this lowercase a. So you can see that the unconditional probability of event A would be equal to this lowercase a, right? Because uh, as I said, so this is just the, the, the proportion of uh, capital A's area over the total area of the big rectangle. So it is equal to the same. So I, actually, so that's a, a, in this case, maybe you can consider another event B. This B is this uh, uh, green rectangle. So this, this, this green rectangle, you see, this, uh, it looks like that. And if we consider the conditional probability of A, given B. Because uh, B is like this, right? So then, so this uh, conditional probability would just be the proportion of A intersected B. So, which is the, so this small rectangle, which is uh, both blue and green, right? 
over the the area of the green rectangle. So because uh, so this green this B is also a, a, a rectangle, so you see that this uh, fraction is still A. So in, in this case, you see it's a conditional prob uh, conditional probability is equal to the unconditional probability, right? So this is an example of uh, two independent events in Venn diagram. So and through this example, we can also see that. If uh, this time we don't know B occurs, but we, instead we know that B does not occur or the complement occurs, right? And because uh, if B is a rectangle, so this B complement would also be a rectangle like this, right? So in this case, you, you can see that. So if uh, the probability of A and the probability of A given B complement should also be equal, right? As we proved last week, so which means that B complement and A will also be independent, right? And also, from this picture, you can tell that so A complement and B will be independent. A complement and B complement will be independent too, right? So I think this is a this is such an example. But from this example, we can see that uh, so this is, so definitely independence would be a more subtle property than say being destroyed, right? Because for A and B to be independent. And actually, you see that here we need to we need to study their geometric properties, right? Not just uh, if they they're joined or not; they're total, uh, totally different. So I think that's why uh, typically we will not use Venn diagram to explain uh, independence because uh, it could be subtle, but since some of you asked me uh, about this question, so I think I can I can I can draw this picture in case that uh, you will have a better understanding. Uh, maybe we can also think of uh, another example. So in this example, so B is is no longer a rectangle, but B looks like that. So in this case, you can see that so this probability of A will still be equal to this lowercase a, right? But because uh, this B is no longer a rectangle, or this side is no longer parallel to this side, because this, you can definitely see, so the probability of A given B should be bigger than the probability of A, right? So because uh, this uh, conditional probability is just the fraction of uh, so this region over entire uh, the, the, the area of B, right? So <coughs> this conditional probability must be bigger than unconditional probability. So I think that's a uh, <coughs> That's an example. So now let's uh, <coughs> let's come back to our lecture. So uh, this time uh, I would like to discuss uh, expected value review. So what is uh, expected value? So first, let's think of uh, uh, discrete random variable, we call it x. And this x uh, may take uh, values within the set D. Of course, this D should be a humble set. The, the expected value of x is defined like this. So what is that? It is just a weighted sum. So 
we take summation over all possible values. So this run of variable we take. So the summation is over the set D, character D, right? And for each possible value, lowercase x, we put a weight there. The weight is just the probability that the run of variable takes lowercase x. So this weighted sum is called the expected value of x. So this is a definition. But the, the question is, how to understand this? Why we need to introduce this, right? So from this definition, you can see that it is just a sum of a, a weighted value, a weighted value of all possible values this run of verbal may take, right? And the, the weight is just a probability. And because of this uh, weighted value and uh, the probability will sum up to 1, so in some sense, so you can think this is actually an average value. But taking average in, in what sense? So that's another question, right? So uh, to explain this, maybe let's, uh, let's consider another example so that you may have a better understanding of this uh, expected value. So let's consider something like this. So we perform a random experiment repeatedly, right? And uh, associated with this uh, random experiment, uh, there is a random variable x, discrete random variable x, capital X. So here, uh, suppose that we perform this uh, experiment n times. And this n is a large number. So here, so over so over those n experiments, so this run variable takes n values. So we use this uh, x1, x2, up to xn for those values. So x1 is the value this run variable takes in the first experiment. X2 is that in the second experiment, and so on, right? And then uh, with those n values, so we can think of the, the sample mean of them. What does the sample mean? Because we perform the experiments, the experiment n times, and we can take the arithmetic mean. It's just uh, X1 plus X2 up to xn divided by n, right? So we use this uh, x bar for this uh, sample mean. So let's think of this sample mean. So actually, uh, this sample mean can be calculated in another way. So to introduce that way, so maybe we, 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 let's first think of uh, so this set D. What is D? This capital D is the set of all possible values that the run variable could take, right? So then we know that because uh, this x is a discrete run variable, it can have a PMF. We just use this uh, lower p, lowercase p of x for its uh, PMF. So it's defined for every number in the set capital D, right? And uh, for each lowercase x, so we use this m of x for the number of experiments that this run of variable takes value x. So recall that we do this uh, experiment n times. Each time, it takes a value, right? And this value must be in the set d. Then over the n experiments, let's just count how many times it takes each specific value in D, right? So then we have M of X. This M of X is just the number of times, so we take X. The run variable takes value X. So with these guys, let's uh, think of the sample mean again. So we know that actually the sample mean is just the, the average value of those uh, the numbers, x1 up to xn, right? So it can also be calculated 
say this way. So this time, in the numerator, we don't just count x, y, x2, and so on. We count different values. So we count different values in the set D, right? Because, uh, so for each lowercase x, so we have uh, m of x times the random variable takes that value. So then we sum up these guys together. We still have the total sum, right? So that's the way. And the uh, denominator, just the sign. So this guy is equal to this guy. And for this sample mean, once we have this expression, actually, it can be written in this way. We've just taken this uh, summation out. Then we do the division. Uh, we, we, so we do the summation after each division. So then, so this one can be written into this one. So the summation, still summation uh, for all possible values. But each time, so this x times m of x over n, right? So just uh, just uh, algebra, maybe algebra, right, from year to year. But, but the question is, why bother to to write in this way? Because uh, in this way, you will, you will see this simple mean now has a has a another interpretation. So. Here, we can see this m of x over n. What is that? m of x is the number of times the random variable takes the value x over the n experiments, right? So then m of x over n would just be the relative frequency that this uh, random variable takes the value x, right? So this, this guy is the uh, relative frequency. So recall that we assume this n is a large number, right? If we perform the random experiments many, many times, then relative frequency should converge to probability, right? So that's a that's a, that's the interpretation of probability. So we introduced that from the very very beginning. So because this actually so this uh, relative frequency should be close to P of x, so which is the probability mass function. So, so here, you see we have this expression. But of course, this is just a approximately equal. It's not strictly equal. So then, you see, this, long, this is pressure. What is that? This is just the expected value. So now you see, so what is the expected value? So what is that? It means that if you perform the experiments many, many times, then the sample mean should converge to something, should converge to a deterministic number. So that number is expected value, right? So we know that sample mean, of course, it is an average value. So this expected, this is expected value can be understood as the long run sample mean. So that's the interpretation. And here, so you can see that, so based on this, if this P of X is large, so which means that with a bigger probability, the runner variable would take this uh, lowercase x. So then the weight of that is also large, right? So then you see, for this expected value, so we put a larger weight for the value that, so for the value that the random variable would take that with a uh, bigger probability. And so this is uh, uh, the interpretation of the expected value. It is just the long run average sample mean. Uh, so I would uh, emphasize that if you check uh, textbooks, so sometimes uh, expected value is also called expectation or simply mean or the first moment. And uh, 
So these would just be the same thing. So the definition would just be like that for discrete random variables. And also, uh, maybe let's recall the, the gambling example, a Tom and Jerry example. So we know that uh, with probability one half, uh, Tom will win one dollar. And uh, with probability one half, uh, he will lose one dollar. So if we use this x for the gain of uh, Tom for a specific game, then what is the expected value of x? So based on this definition, so this x, this, this random variable x can only take two different values, 1 or minus 1, right? So with, with probability 1 half, it takes 1, then with, with 1 half, it takes minus 1. So then you can see that the expected value of that is just, uh, just 0. But then what does it mean? It means that if Tom played this game, many, many times, then on average, each game, he can win only for zero dollars, right? So in this sense, you see the game is a fair game. Fair game means that you cannot really turn anything from this game, no matter, of course, it's a, over a long period of time. If you play, play this game many, many times, so that's a fair game. Why this game is fair? Because the die is fair, right? As long as the chance of winning is one half, then the game is fair. So this is a very simple example. And uh, so I think uh, on this slide, that's exactly what I explained just now. So, so maybe uh, that's a... Let me, let me summarize uh, what we discussed just now. So what is the difference? We, we need to be clear. What will be the difference between the sample mean and the expected value? So first, the sample mean, as, as I explained just now, it is just the arithmetic mean of a sample set. We perform this random experiment n times. We have n values. The sum of those n values divided by n, so which is the sample mean. So <coughs> because uh, the experiment is random, so which means that if I perform the experiment n times today, we will get a sample mean. If we do that tomorrow for n times, we will get another sample mean. Those two sample means may not be the same, right? So in this sense, you can see that actually the sample mean is random. The sample mean is not deterministic. However, the expected value is deterministic because uh, as long as you know the distribution of the random variable, so this p of x is fixed, and uh, the set of possible values is also fixed. So through this expression, you see that this expected value of x is deterministic, no randomness, right? So you mm -hmm. must be very clear. Those are two different things. It would not be the same. So, so as I just explained, different sample size may yield different sample means. But anyway, expected value is fixed, no randomness, right? But as I explained just now, if the sample size is large enough, so which means n is large enough, so this sample mean should be close to the expected value. And this expected value can be understood as the long-run sample mean, long-run average sample mean, right? So then, uh, because of this, sometimes uh, so this sample mean can be used to estimate the expected value. So sometimes maybe the distribution of a, of a random variable can be difficult to calculate. It could be difficult to find out explicit formula for that distribution. But it could be, it could be relatively easy to generate values 
of this random variable through simulation by using computers. But then, in this case, so we may just uh, generate so the random numbers that follow certain distribution, even if we don't know that distribution, and then take the sample mean. We do that many, many times and take the sample mean, and, and using this sample mean to to estimate the expected value. Actually, this is the the, the fundamental idea of the Monte Carlo simulation. I think later, uh, I think maybe uh, after in several weeks we will discuss simulation, and uh, you will understand this better. So this is the difference between the sample mean and the expected value. And uh, uh, so maybe let me discuss uh, several properties of uh, of, the, uh, of expected values. So before I introduce uh, uh, those properties, uh, I think I would emphasize that so these properties uh, apply to all random variables. So so far we only introduced the definition of expected value of a discrete random variable. But these, these properties are applicable to all random variables, not just the discrete ones. So here, uh, let's consider two random variables, capital X and capital Y. And we use this uh, A and B for two real numbers. So we call that capital letters for random variables and lowercase letters for constants or deterministic numbers, right? So first, the first property is, uh, is a trivial one. The trivial one, so expectation of a uh, deterministic number is equal to that number. So this, this, so this one may, 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 seem, may seem a bit confusing because uh, so this one is, is not really a random variable, right? It's not no randomness. But how, how to understand this? So here, so this lowercase a, is viewed as a random variable with a probability that it takes value A with probability 1, right? So because of this, you can see that this property is just a, a trivial one, but, but but sometimes, so it could be useful. Because uh, when you think of expect, uh, expected value, there could be some constants involved. By using this, if you can if you think of a, a, a determinist number as a special random variable, then by using this, it can help you to simplify the calculation. And uh, uh, the, the next expectation is like this. Uh, expected value of uh, x plus b is equal to the expected value of x plus b. So, which means that we can, if this b is the determinist number, we can we can take it out from the expectation, right? So, how to how to prove this? You just uh, you just follow this uh, you just follow this definition. So, which is uh, actually it's uh, it's pretty simple. And uh, uh, the third property is the the so-called linearity, so which says that if we consider the expectation or expected value of uh, the sum of two random variables, then uh, it should be equal to the sum of their respective expected values. So this is the third property. I think I, I, I don't bother to prove this. If you are interested, uh, you, can, you can check the textbook. But the thing is, uh, the proof may not be required in, the, in, this, in this course, but you need to know so these properties. And the fourth property is also part of the uh, linearity uh, property. So it says that expectation of A times X is equal to A times the expected value. So which means that if you have uh, a coefficient, then it can be taken out. So then how to understand this? So first, because X is a random variable, then so this A times X is also a random variable, right? What is a random variable? A random variable is just a function of all terms. 
So the input is a O prompt, the output is a real number, right? So in this sense, this A times X is also a random number, right? So the input is O prompt, the output is A times that value, right? So because uh, it's a random variable, then it makes sense to talk about the expected value of that. And the expected value of that is just uh, A times of the original expected value. So this one is also very easy to prove by using the definition. So I will leave it uh, for you as an exercise. So why the expected value is so important? I think uh, it's largely because of this result. So this is uh, so this uh, theorem is called strong law of large numbers. So in the entire probability theory, so there are two theorems. So that are the most important. The first one is this uh, strong law of large numbers. And the second one is the central limit theorem, right? So, so now let's first study the, the, the first one, so strong law of large numbers. So here, uh, we consider an infinite sequence of uh, independent, identically distributed random variables. So we call them x1, x2, and so on, an uh, infinite sequence. So here you see that, uh, so the term independent, identically distributed, a color blue. So let me explain that. So we have a sequence of random variables, and these random variables are independent. So what does it mean? What does independence among random variables mean? So here, we haven't, we haven't given you the, the, the formal definition of that, but I think it's not difficult to understand. So maybe you can think of uh, two random variables, x and y. So two random variables are independent, so which means that no matter what value x takes, it won't affect the probability that y takes whatever value, which means independent. So the idea would just be the same. When we talk about the independence between two events, it means, as I explained, it means uh, they have nothing to do with each other. So whether A happens would not affect the probability that B happens, right? So we just think of the same idea. If we have two random variables, x and y, no matter what value x takes, we know the value of x, but it won't help you to know more about the value y would take. In other words, it won't change the distribution of y. Then x and y will be independent. That's the idea. So if you have more than two random variables, you have a bunch of them. So the independence means if you take any two of them, any three of them, any four of them, they should be independent. You know the values of x1, x2, x3, they won't change the distribution of x1. Right? So that's the idea. IAD. So that's the independence, which means that they just have nothing to do with each other. You can consider them separately without affecting others. So that's the meaning. So then identically distributed, what does it mean? Identical means the same, right? Identically distributed means uh, all those random variables have the same distribution. So if they are discrete random variables, they have the same PMF. So that's the meaning. So <laughs> So that's the meaning of uh, independent, identically distributed. Because this condition is so often used, then from now on, we just use uh, IID for that. So that's the meaning of IID, right? So here, we have uh, a sequence of random variables because they have the same distribution. They must have the same expected value, right? You know the distribution, you know the expected value. 
So we use mu for this common expected value of all those guys. Then let's think of uh, the sample mu of them. We have x1 up to xn, and this, we take the summation divided by uh, n. Then this x bar is the, the sample mean of x1 up to xn, right? So then this theorem, this strong law of large number, says that as n goes large, this sample mean will converge to the expected value, right? So this is the strong law of large number. So think of that. So I think you, you may have realized that. So what is that? It's just a, what did we explain just now, right? So it's the same thing as this. So here, what we explain is just uh, we do a uh, random experiment, do that n times, then the sample mean should be, when n is large, should be close to the expected value, right? That's exactly the strong law of large number says. Then you may ask me the question, why bother to say the same thing twice? We already explained this here, right? Because uh, if you recall, how did I explain so this result here? I use the idea that relative frequency should be close to probability. So which is uh, which was uh, introduced at the very very beginning of this of my of my course, right? And I explained to you that this is just an interpretation or the motivation for introducing probability. It is not a rigorous foundation of probability theory. So what is the foundation of probability theory, which is the definition of probability space? So for this theorem, because it is a theorem, actually it is a rigorous result derived from the very beginning. The very beginning is the probability space, the mathematical foundation. So from that definition of probability, then with those conditions, we can finally prove this. But here, what I explained just now, it is just an intuitive explanation. It is not rigorous, right? So then it must be very clear. So this thing is just interpretation or explanation. And uh, if we put everything in a rigorous way, then we should have this uh, theorem called the strong law of large numbers. So that's why I need to explain that here. And uh, <coughs> I think I need to mention that so this uh, strong law of large numbers uh, is a very powerful result because uh, it applies to any random variable, no matter whether no matter it's uh, discrete or continuous as long as it has a finite expected value, then it must be true, right? So this is the strong law of large numbers. So actually, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about this strong law of large numbers. So I will consider a special case of that. To introduce this special case, maybe uh, let me introduce a special type of uh, random variable, which is called indicator random variable. So what is the uh, indicator random variable? So usually we use a uh, letter I for indicator. So this indicator random variable is defined for an event. Maybe we can call it A. So A is an event. And uh, this uh, indicator random variable is defined as this. So because it is a random variable, it is just a function of all, right? 
if you know the outcome, then you should be able to know the, va uh, the value of this random variable, right? Then uh, this imitator random variable defines like this. If the outcome is in A, then the random variable takes value 1. If the outcome is not in A, it takes value 0. So you see, it's pretty simple. So why is called indicator? Because uh, it indicates whether A occurs or not, right? So if A occurs, or if the outcome is in A, then it is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So then, uh, it's pretty simple, right? So here, because of this uh, uh, definition, we can see that so this indicator random variable can only take two different values, 1 or 0. So it's discrete. And because it's discrete, then we can specify its uh, PMF. Its PMF is also pretty simple. P of 1 is equal to the probability of A, right? Because uh, when this random variable takes 1, which means the outcome must be in A or A occurs. So the probability of 1 would be P of A. And because of this, so P of 0 must be 1 minus P of A, right? And here, once we have the PMF of this indicator random variable, we can calculate its uh, expected value, right? So it, it can take two different values, and those two values times the corresponding probabilities, then you see the expected value of i is simply equal to the probability of a. So it looks very nice, right? So keep in mind, because uh, this indicator random variable would be very useful. So sometimes we just, uh, so when we solve certain questions, so we need to we need to tell whether an event occurs or not. Then, how can we how can we do that? So typically, we can define an indicator for the variable for that specific event. Then, so this one when it, when when this event occurs, it takes one. If it doesn't occur, it takes zero. So then, by using a random so then. We just uh, we just translate so such a case into a random variable. So then it's uh, easier for us to handle because for a random variable we can do many operations. We can add them together, so times something and uh, whatever, right? So then that's uh, <coughs> why this uh, indicator variable is so so useful. I think later, maybe, you know, for more questions, uh, you'll encounter so, so such a, such a random variables. So here, let's think of, uh, let's think of uh, the strong law of large numbers when the IV random variables are all indicator random variables. In this case, let's see what will happen. So, suppose we have a sequence of ID in a good run of variables. We call them I1, I2, and so on. They are defined for the same event, for the same event A. But we assume they're independent, right? So, maybe you can think of that in this way. So, you perform the random experiment. For the first time, if A occurs, this I1 will take 1. Otherwise, it will take 0. Right? Then, you know the value of I1. And you do this random, random experiment again. For the second time, if A occurs, I2 is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's 0. And so on. Right? So then, you have a, a bunch of random variables, I1, I2, and so on. And uh, by the discussion just now, we know that 
the exact value of each of them should be equal to the probability of one, A, right? And uh, let's think of the sample average of I1 up to IA. So, of course, it should be defined like that, right? So, let's think of the, the numerator, which is the sum of I1 up to IN, right? So, recall that each I is just an indicator. If A occurs, it's 1. Otherwise, it's 0. So, we perform the random experiments n times, right? So, each time, if A occurs, so the indicator is 1. So, if we sum up, sum them up together, so each I is either 1 or 0. So, you can see that, so I1 plus I2 up to IN would be just the, the number of times A occurs, right? So the numerator is just the number of times A occurs among the N experiments. If this guy divided by N, what is that? It's the relative frequency that A occurs among the N experiments. Right? So, this I bar N is the sample mean. And the strong wall of large numbers tells us that if N is large, so this sample mean should converge to expected value. What is the expected value of this indicator? The expected value is just a P of A, the probability, right? So you see, now we have this result. What is that, this result? So this I bar, as I explained, is a relative frequency. This P of A is a probability. So actually, this is a, just something we're very familiar, which means that, so as N goes large, the relative frequency will converge to the corresponding probability, right? That's exactly the interp interpretation of probability I explained at the beginning of this course, right? So now maybe let me help you to, to organize all those things. So first, at the beginning of this course, I gave you an explanation of probability. I interpret it as a lower relative frequency, right? But later, I said it's just an interpretation. It's not a rigorous foundation. What is the reverse foundation, which is the probability space itself, right? Then I explained to you that if probability can be interpreted as a relative frequency, then it should satisfy the first condition, the second condition, third condition, right? So then, which is the, the three, which are the three conditions in the definition of a probability space, right? So then I said, so from now on, everything should be derived in a rigorous way from probability space. But actually, so there's still a missing link or a gap. So I motivate probability, probability by using relative frequency. And then using this idea to introduce probability space, especially those three conditions. But the question is, can we come back to verify the relative frequency interpretation of probability, right? So from this part, I motivate that part. But so it seems that so the, the, the condition in probability space would just be necessary, necessary conditions. Can we go back to, to verify our so initial interpretation. So you see, so this this part, so this special case of strong law of large numbers can help us to fill in that gap. So that's the so then with this link, 
the entire idea would be closed, right? So the, the so that that's why I think it's a, it's important. So from this, we can see we can safely take so there's a probability as a normal relative frequency and without any issue, right? So this is a uh, so this is why. This strong law of large number is so important because uh, it also shows that if we begin with the probability space, then we can verify all of our intuitive explanations of probability. Right? So uh, let me introduce another uh, very useful a result about expected value. So this is uh, how to calculate the expected value of, uh, of a function of a random variable. So here, uh, suppose this x is a discrete random variable, and uh, it can take value within a countable set d. And the, the PMF of that is uh, this uh, locus p. So this time, let's think of uh, a function, we we'll call it h, or is h, right? So what is a function? This function just, uh, think, you think of that, so the input is a real number, or the output is another real number, right? If it is uh, such a thing, then it makes sense for us to think of h of x, a function of a random variable, right? What is a random variable? A random variable is also a function, but, this fun but the input of this function is all common. Input is outcome, output is a real number, right? If the output of this random variable becomes the input of another function, h, then the output, because the, the output of random variable is a real number, so then we insert that into h, the output of h will be a random variable, right? If you think of h of x together, you can see that this h of x should also be a random variable because the, the input of this composite function will be all calm and the output is a real number, right? So h of x is another random variable. Because uh, it is a random variable, then it makes sense to talk about the expected value of that, so which is this uh, e of h of x. How to calculate that? So the result actually is very is also very intuitive. So recall that the definition of the expected value of a random variable x is like this. We just take a summation over all possible values. So this random variable may take, right? And uh, at each value, so we gave a weight. So this weight is just the probability, right? So then, if this time we think of uh, a function of the random variable, this h of x, then we can still think of the, the same set. Because of this random variable x can only take values within this uh, set d, right? And uh, for each value in this set, for each possible value, we know that so this function, function of a random variable, will take this value, h of uh, lowercase x, right? And it takes this value and uh, with what probability? With probability p of x, right? So then, you see, so this idea will be just the same as the definition of uh, expected value. But of course, so this is a this is a proposition. You need to prove that. But as I just explained, it is very easy to understand this. You can see that this result must be correct. So again, as I explained, we just take a summation over all possible values. The random variable x may take at each possible value. This function will take value h of x, and the corresponding probability is given, right? Then 
we take the probability as a, as a weight and take the weight of salt and we get this uh, expected value of a function of one mole volume. If, in, uh, if you're interested in the uh, proof, I think you can go back to check the textbook. But here, uh, I think for the sake of time, I just give you a very intuitive explanation. So <coughs> let's, uh, now let's think of a, a special case uh, of the previous result. So here, uh, we take this function h as this form. h of x is equal to x minus mu squared. So what is mu? This mu is just a, a constant or a deterministic number, but it, it is not an arbitrary number. It's a, actually, it is a, it's defined as an expected value of a random variable x. So keep in mind, this mu is the expected value of uh, the random variable x. So then let's think of uh, the expected value of h of x with h uh, defined in this way. So then what is that? According to, to this definition, so this uh, expected value of h of x actually is just the expected value of x minus mu squared. Right? Because if h is like this. And uh, according to this result, because each h of x is just uh, x minus mu squared, so this guy is equal to this. Right? You take the summation over all possible values like that. And uh, so this thing actually has a special name, which is called the variance of x. And uh, we may use this v uh, to denote the variance. So v of x actually is defined in this way. And uh, the square root of the variance is called standard deviation, the standard deviation of x. So then you ask me the question, uh, why bother to consider this uh, the special h of x, the expected value of h of x. Because, uh, so we usually use this uh, variance so to, to describe or to, to quantify, to quantify the variability of a random variable. So maybe, let me, let me show you an example so that you can have a better understanding of that. So, Suppose here we have two random variables. So the first random variable has a distribution like this. So it is the PMF of that uh, random variable. So you see that this uh, random variable may take three different values, minus 1, 0, and 1. And you see that the PMF is, uh, you see the shape of that, is symmetric with respect to 0. Right. The probability that it takes 1 is equal to the probability that it takes, uh, it takes minus 1, right? Both are 0.3. So in this case, actually, so if I ask you to calculate the expected value of this random variable, you can see it must be equal to 0, right? Because uh, it's a metric with respect to 0. And uh, this is the first random variable. And the second random variable, has uh, the distribution like this. So it may take uh, nine different values, minus four up to four, right? And you can see that, so the, the PMF is also symmetric with, with respect to zero, right? So which means that the probability that it takes one is equal to the probability that it takes minus one takes 2 equals to minus 2, or whatever, right? Because of this, the expected value of uh, the second random variable is also equal to 0, which is the same as the first one, right? So 
the first one and the second one have the same expected value. But first, so you see their, their, their distributions will be very different. So even if they have the same expected value. Why they're so different? Because uh, for the first guy, you can see it can only take three different values. And those values uh, are pretty close to each other, right? So in other words, it has, a, it has less variability. So variable means uh, easy to change, right? So it can only take minus one, zero, one. So, so it's the value of that or the behavior of that is a pretty invariant. But for the second guy, it could be it could be different. With a pretty big probability, it can take a value away from the center. Right? So in other words, it's more vulnerable. It has more probability. Right? So then so you can see that even if they have the same expected value, the behavior will be very different. And the question is how to quantify so their, the difference of their behavior, how to quantify the variability. So the easiest way is to, to use this uh, the variance, right? So you see, what is the definition of the variance? Again, so it's like this. The variance is a summation of all possible values. It's going to verbally take. And uh, for each value, we need to evaluate the distance between that value and uh, uh, between this value from the expected value and take square times the probability, right? So you can see that based on this definition, if with a bigger probability. So this runner variable may take a value far away from the expected value. Then this variance will tend to be bigger. Right? Again, so just like here, if a runner variable tend to take a value away from the expected value with a bigger probability, then this sum tends to be bigger, right? So if just think of uh, those two guys. Of course, it's not this definition because uh, for the second distribution with a very big probability, it can take four or minus four. If I take four or minus four, so this one could be 16, right? And then it will be much, much bigger than just, uh, than just this distribution, because this distribution can only take, at most, minus one and one, right? In this case, x minus mu squared is just one, right? But actually, for, for those two random variables, the variance of the first one is just 0.6, and the second one is uh, is almost 12, right? So this, uh, the second one actually is, uh, is much bigger. So here uh, we see this is uh, this is why uh, we need a variance because uh, we we use it to to quantify the, the variability of the distribution. So if a random variable has a, a bigger variance. That's a big number, or with a larger probability, it can be away from the expected value, right? So expected value can be considered, in some sense, as the center of the distribution. So which means that, so with a bigger probability, so this run of variable can take a value away from the center. So in other words. So if you check their distributions, BMF, so a distribution that have a bigger variance tends to be better, right? Because uh, 
with a bigger probability, it can take your value away from center. So that's the <coughs> that's why I want to introduce this uh, variance. So for for variance, of course, uh, there are certain properties. So for example, the the variance of uh, x plus uh, determinist number will be the same as the variance of x. And also, so so we have uh, a bunch of uh, uh, properties, and those properties uh, apply to any random variables, not just for the square random variables. So why we must have this? We must have this property, the first property. Actually, it's a uh, it's not difficult to understand. So we know that x is a random variable, right? So again, x plus b, b is a determinist number, is also a random variable, right? If we know the, the distribution of x, say x that just looks like that, then let's think of what will be the distribution of uh, x plus b. Actually, you can easily see that the distribution of x and x plus b, at least the shape of that, will be the, exactly the same. We just need to shift the center from shift to the center to the left by distance b, right? So because of the, the the distribution has the same shape, in other words, the variability will not change, right? The mean will change because the center will be changed, but the shape will be the same. The variability will not change, right? So, at least intuitively, we must have this result because variance is used to quantify variability. Of course, this is just an explanation. If you are interested in the proof, I think you just uh, uh, you just follow the definition, and it's very easy to see. So. Uh, the second property, the variance of a times x, so here a is a is determinist number, is equal to a squared times the variance. So how to prove that? Again, follow the follow the definition, right? You see that if uh, if mu is the expected value of x, then the expected value of a times x must be equal to a mu. Right? So, we explain here. Because uh, then, if we plug, if we replace x with, uh, with a times x, so in this formula, we also need to replace mu with a mu, right? So, which is the variance of ax. Then, because of this uh, square term, so this uh, the common constant a can be taken out, but if we take it out, it becomes a squared, right? So that's a, that's the idea. I think uh, again, I leave it to you. And uh, uh, so there's a shortcut formula for the the variance. The variance can also be calculated in this way. We know that the definition is expect expected value of x minus mu squared, but it is also equal to the expected value of x squared minus mu squared. So, again, this is just uh, the basic algebra. You just, uh, I just, if you wish to verify that, we do that. And there's another, another uh, very important result, to which is like that. Uh, if we have uh, two independent random variables, x and y, so the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variance. So this is a this is a very important result. So this is true. This is true uh, if they're independent. If they're not independent, generally, it is not true. So I think uh, so far uh, maybe uh, we don't have sufficient. Uh, I think uh, so. This one, uh, 
If you're interested, we can, you can check the textbook. So these are certain uh, properties, and I think uh, you, need to, you need to you need to know uh, these properties. Uh, any questions before I move on? Uh, if no questions, let's have a, a ten minute break. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let's, uh, let's move on. So I noticed that some of you uh, asked me this question about this uh, Sharkov formula. Uh, I think it's uh, actually it's pretty simple. So let's, let me see if I can write it down here. Say so, uh, if we wish to, to pr prove this Sharkov formula, we know that it's uh, the definition is equal to this, right? What is this guy? So we know that this uh, x minus mu square actually is equal to x square minus 2 mu x plus mu square, right? So then uh, by the by the uh, property of uh, expectation. Actually, this is equal to the expectation of x squared minus expectation of uh, 2 mu x plus expectation of mu squared, right? So the first term, we just leave it there. The second term, this 2 mu, can be taken out. 2 mu e of x plus e of uh, a constant, so which is uh, mu squared, right? And uh, we know that this e of x actually is equal to mu, so it's uh, e of x squared minus 2 mu squared plus mu squared, which is... Uh, now let's see, which is the shock of formula, right? So it's pretty simple. Next, we will uh, discuss uh, several specific distributions, so specific type of uh, random variables. Uh, the, first, the first distribution is so-called Bernoulli distribution, so which is, uh, uh, I think, maybe the, the simplest one. To introduce a, a Bernoulli distribution, maybe we need to first introduce the notion of a Bernoulli trial. What is a Bernoulli trial? Actually, it's pretty simple. Uh, a Bernoulli trial is just an experiment whose outcome is random or binary. So, which means that if you perform this experiment, there's only two outcomes. So, we call them success or failure. But actually, this is a this is just a flipping a coin. So, you can call it. Success or failure, or heads or tails. So maybe I will call them so heads and tails more often. But but here uh, it's a it's a bit different from flipping a coin because uh, so this coin may not be a fair coin. So which means that if you flip it, the chance that the probability that you see has may not be one half. It could be any number p uh, from 0 to 1. So with probability p, the outcome is a success or it has. With probability 1 minus p, the outcome is a failure or, or tails, right? So this is a Bernoulli trial. So again, 
What is a Bernoulli trial? Bernoulli trial is just a flip in the coin. But the probability of has may not be equal to one half. And then, uh, so with this a Bernoulli trial, we can define a random variable, x. So if uh, the if it's uh, the outcome is is uh, the success or has this uh, random variable takes one or tails, it takes zero. And then so such a guy is called the Bernoulli random variable. So see, Bernoulli random variable can only take two different values, either one or zero. With probability p, it is equal to one. With probability p, it is equal to zero. So you'll see the PMF, PMF of that is just uh, just like that. And uh, so what is the definition of a Bernoulli random variable? So any random variable whose only possible values are either 0 or 1 is called a Bernoulli random variable. And actually, so this is not the first time we see Bernoulli random variable because uh, so this indicator random variable is a Bernoulli random variable, right? So, however, this indicator random variable is just a special case of Bernoulli random variable because uh, it's associated with the uh, event, right? So, only if we have an event that then it makes sense to define an indicator random variable of that. But based on the definition of Bernoulli random variable, because the indicator can only take either one or zero, so definitely it is a Bernoulli random variable. So, <coughs> Bernoulli random variable actually is a, it's the simplest guy, so with some randomness. What is the expected value of that? So, we just follow the formula. With probability p is one, and uh, otherwise is zero. So, the expected value of that is just equal to p. And what is the, the variance of that? The variance of that is just uh, we just follow the definition. The variance is the expected value of x minus expected value squared, right? We know that the expected value of Bernoulli is p, so we just follow this. And because of the probability p, x takes 1. With probability 1 minus p, it takes 0. So it is just given by this expression, if we simplify that, it's equal to p times 1 minus p, right? So, so very simple, but keep in mind, because it is so simple. So I, I think it, you, you, need to, you need to memorize that. So expect the value of that is just equal to p. The variance is just p times 1 minus p, which is Bernoulli. So Bernoulli is very simple. Then let's think of uh, another distribution, which is called the geometric distribution. What is the geometric distribution? Uh, we still think of Bernoulli trials, or we still flip the coin, right? Again, this with probability p, so the coin will will show halves. With probability one minus p, it will show tails. So then we flip this coin. And then we flip it until I see the first halves. I stop. Again, I flip this coin until I see first the halves. I stop. It is possible that I flip it and uh, for the first and uh, I flip it for the first time. I see halves. I stop. Right. It is also possible that I flip it. The first flip is tails, and the second one is halves. Then I stop. So in this way, you can see that the number of times until the number of flips until I see first the halves could be one, two, three, four, all positive integers, right? So then the number of flips until I see the first the halves is a random, which is called a geometric random variable with parameter p. P is the probability of has. The number of flips 
until I see the first to have his call, which I'm actually wearing now. Right? So, based on this description, we can find out the probability mass function of this uh, geometric distribution. It has a uh, uh, this geometric random variable may take value one, two, three, and so on. Then let's think of what is the probability that it takes value k. It takes value k means that I flip it, I flip the coin k times until I see the first hat, right? So flip k times, which means that the first k minus one flips or tails. And the k flip is heads, right? So what is the probability of that? Because each flip is independent. It won't affect other flips. So the probability that I see all tails in the first k minus 1 flips would be 1 minus p to the power k minus 1, right? And then at the k flip, I see has. The probability of that would be p. So you see the probability that, so this random variable takes k should follow this expression, which is the probability mass function, right? Then, what is the expected value of this geometric random variable? So, E of x, by definition, we just uh, take a summation over all possible values this random variable may take. This random variable may take 1, 2, 3, whatever, right? So, we just take a summation from k, k from 1 up to infinity, because it could be any positive integer, right? With this probability, it will take value k, right? So then, so this is the expression for the expected value of a geometric random variable. So this one doesn't look very uh, nice, but in the end, we can show that it's uh, simply equal to 1 over p, right? So this is the uh, expected value. Let me, let me show you how to, how to calculate this uh, expected value. So here, so what we wish to do is, is like this. So this x is a geometric random variable, right? So with, uh, again, with the uh, number of flips that you to see the first pass. And uh, we just uh, explained that the expected value should follow to this formula, right? So then how to, how to calculate that? Actually, we need to use the, uh, we, need, we need to use geometric series to calculate this. So maybe let's recall what is the geometric series. Geometric series actually just, uh, it's just a summation. It's just a sum. So here, so let's think of a, a, run of, uh, a real number, A, and another number, Q, which is between minus 1 and 1. So geometric series is just a, so this sum. A plus A times Q plus A Q squared plus A Q cubed and so on. So, until q to the power all positive all positive integers. But I think I suppose uh, you know the result. I think it's uh, it's covered in high school algebra. It's simply equal to a over one minus q, right? So in case that you cannot remember that, maybe let me show you a derivation of that. Of that. It's uh, pretty, pretty simple. So, for example, if we use this B to denote, so this, uh, this sum, this geometric series, so which is equal to this, and then let's think of what is uh, B times Q. The B times Q, so essentially it's just a, 
each term on the right hand side should be should time q, right? If the first term is a, a times q becomes a q. A q times q becomes a times q q, and so on, right? So you see that b times q should be equal to this, like this. And if we compare, so the right hand side of the first one and the right hand side of the second one, we see there are a lot of common terms, right? If we use the, so the first one minus the second one, the left hand side will become b minus bq. And the right hand side, all of those common terms will be canceled out, right? Only, so the first term a would be here, would be left. And then as a result, we have b minus bq as equal to a, or b is equal to a minus uh, b is equal to a over 1 minus q, right? So that's why this uh, this geometric series is simply continuous. So again, so let's go back to to calculate this uh, expected value right here. So this expected value is written in this way, right? So, so you see that uh, it looks pretty similar to geometric series. However, if we don't have this k, if we don't have this k here, it's just a geometric series, and we just follow this formula to, to calculate that. But this k is, uh, is a bit annoying, right? With this k, it doesn't seem the same as this one. And then the question is how to, how to do that with this k here. Uh, there is a, a common technique to handle this. Is to, so let me, let me show you this. Now, let's do that. This is, a, this is the expected value, the expression of the expected value, right? Again, so this k is annoying. So how to, how to derive this by using geometric series? The trick is we can write this k as a summation of k once, right? You see that this, uh, this k, the color yellow, actually is, uh, is just equal to this. It's just a summation for j from 1 to k of once. So then you may ask me the question, why, why bother to do this? It seems that you just uh, make a complicated thing even more complicated, right? Because, uh, because if the, the coefficient is 1, 1 times this, it will look very similar to geometric series, right? If 1 times this guy ends, if we can sum up this, then we can use geometric series. So that, that's the idea. But again, how can, how can, we, do, how can we do that? So the so next step, we will need to change the order of summation. Because here, this summation now becomes a double summation. So first, we'll need to take the summation for j and then for k, right? But as I said, if we can change the order of summation, if we can do the summation for k first, then we will have geometric series. So that's the idea. That's why we bother to do this. At first, we make it more complicated, but it gives us the way to simplify things in next steps. So then, let's, let's switch the order of summation. So here, how, how, can we, how can we do that? So first, then we need to take care of uh, j and k. So here, we need to take the summation for j first and then for k. And again, to use geometric series, we need to take summation for k first. If we wish to switch the order of summation, we need to be a bit careful because uh, for this, uh, uh, for because of this term, you can see that this j can be taken only from 1 up to k. In other words, this j cannot be bigger than k, right? 
So if we switch the order of summation, we need to be careful. K, because K is bigger or equal to J, the index of K cannot be cannot begin with 1. It can start only from J. So if we switch the order, then the summation from the summation for K should be from J to infinity. And for J, it's a 1 from infinity. It is a, J should be bigger or equal to 1, right? So now we have this expression. We have this expression. So, uh, which is uh, which is great because uh, if you check this part, so the the first summation, you see that uh, geometric series. What is the geometric series? Geometric series is just the first term over one minus the common coefficient, the common factor, right? The first term divided by 1 minus the factor, then you have the, the value of the geometric series. Because k is from j, the first term, we just plug in this j into this expression to get the first term. So the first term is here. 1 minus p to the power j minus 1 times p, right? And uh, for this geometric series, you can see that the common factor is 1 minus p, right? So if we plug in here, so the denominator, 1 minus q, will look like this. So you see, the denominator is 1 minus 1 minus q, 1 minus p, so which is uh, equal to p, right? So this p will be canceled out with the p in Numerator. So now, next, we have this one left. You see, we have uh, another geometric series. So this geometric series, actually, uh, the common factor is, is, uh, is also 1 minus p. How to calculate that? Because uh, we just do the same thing. The first term of that is simply for j is equal to 1. For j is equal to 1, 1 minus p to the power 0 which is equal to 1, right? That's the first term of the geometric series. And then uh, over 1 minus the common factor, the co uh, then the denominator is p. So now we have this one over p. So this is how we calculate the, the expected value of, uh, of uh, this uh, geometric random variable. Here, but I think, uh, uh, of course, in the exam, you don't you don't bother to you don't have to know how to how to switch switch the order of summation or something like that. I just uh, wish to show you that this this uh, this can computable and uh, uh, based on some basic techniques, so uh, you can you can derive this. I just uh, wish to make you believe this. So, uh, and actually, by using the same techniques, uh, we can calculate the variance of uh, geometric distribution, so which is equal to 1 minus p over p squared. But uh, uh, we need to use the, to this trick twice, so it will be more complicated. So I don't bother to, to show you this. Uh, I think for the geometric distribution, you need to you need to memorize the probability mass function, and you also need to to know the expected value. You don't you don't have to know how to get this, but you need to memorize the expected value is equal to one over p because it's too simple and. Uh, you may, you may use that frequently later, right? You need to know this. But for the variance, you don't have, you don't have to memorize that. So this is the uh, geometric distribution. So actually, uh, this is not the, the first time uh, we see a geometric random variable because uh, uh, 
several weeks ago, uh, I gave you an example, so which is a driven past example. In that example, uh, the number of uh, paths into a Gemini driver selects is actually a geometrical undeniable. So maybe uh, let's recall that. So if I wish to have a driver selects, I need to pass the driving past. Suppose the 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 the, the rule, the regulation of that is like this. If I fail, then I need to take it again. So until I pass the, the driving path for the first time, then I can get my lessons, right? So then, as I explained, just like you flip a coin. So the number until you see the first hex, right? So you see, so this is, a, in this example, it's, a, it's a, the number of paths I take until I pass must follow a geometric distribution. And uh, uh, this uh, geometric distribution has a, a very interesting property called memorlessness. So, so let me let me let me explain this. So why why this one has a, has this property? To explain uh, this uh, memorlessness uh, for geometric distribution, so maybe let's first consider the probability that a geometric random variable bigger than n. Let's think of this. X is a geometric random variable. What is the probability that it's bigger than n? Of course, we can just uh, we can just calculate that by using the the PMF of uh, of uh, geometric distribution, right? The PMF will look like that, so which is the probability this random variable takes value k. Because uh, x is bigger than n, so this k should be from n plus 1 up to infinity. So what is this? It is, uh, it is just a geometric series. Geometric series, uh, the first term is for k is equal to n plus 1. We plug in this guy into here. We have this numerator, right? Denominator should be 1 minus the common coefficient. Then we have this guy. So this is the probability that x bigger than n. So this one, uh, actually, you don't, you don't, you don't have to bother to, to calculate it in this, in this way because uh, what is x? It's just a number of flips until you see first hex, right? If uh, x is bigger than n, it means that for the first n flips, you see all tails, right? So what is the probability that you see n tails? 1 minus p to the power n. That's it. So this one is very easy to understand, right? You just flip it, tails for n times. That's it. So now, please keep this result in mind. The number of flips, so you see first the has bigger than n is equal to that. Now let's think of the next question. Suppose you flip this, this coin n times, all tails. Then you ask to calculate the probability. So the probability is that what is the probability you need more than n additional flips before getting the first hex? So you already flip n times all tails. You wish to know what is the probability that you need more than n extra flips and you will see the first hex. What is this probability? So you see, it's a, you're asked to calculate the conditional probability, right? What is the condition? The condition is that you have failed or you, you have seen tails for n times. The first n flips all tails, right? That's the, that's the condition. Given this condition, what is the probability you need more than an extra flips? 
what is that that Moore's Law has? We can figure this out. We just need to follow the definition of conditional probability, right? So what is this conditional probability? The condition is that you see, you have seen n tails, so x bigger than m, right? The first n flips or tails. And you need more than n additional trials. So the total number of flips you need until you see the first has will be bigger than n plus n, right? So this is, uh, you just need to calculate this conditional probability. How to calculate that? Follow the definition. So in the numerator will be the probability of the intersection. In the denominator will be the probability of the condition. So the intersection would be x bigger than n intersect x bigger than n. So here, I would emphasize that. So when we write down the statement like this, so the comma means intersection. Comma means intersection. It's not the union. It must be very clear of this. Again, comma means intersection. It means x bigger than m plus n and x bigger than n. Right? So here, you just said this is an intersection. You can see that the first event must be a subset of the second event. Because uh, as long as x is bigger than m plus n, x must be bigger than m, right? And because of this, the intersection is just uh, the first event. x is bigger than m plus n, right? Then we have uh, this expression. In the numerator, that's the probability that you have uh, m plus n tails, right? You have all tails in the first n plus n flips. What is the probability of that? You just use this result, right? That's 1 minus p to the power n plus n. Denominator is x to the probability that x bigger than m, which is equal to this. Then you see what is this result? It's 1 minus p to the power n. So it looks pretty simple, but and also you realize that this probability is just the probability that x is bigger than n, right? So now that uh, after so this uh, derivation, that's that's what we have. On the right hand side, it's uh, the probability that we need more than n extra flips, given that we already have n tails until we see the first has, right? That's on the left-hand side. On the, on the right-hand side is the probability that we need more than n flips until we see the first has. Huh? So this is the property. And this property is called the memorlessness. Then you ask me the question, so why? Why such a property is called memorlessness? What, what does it mean, right? Actually, so if we think of uh, the right hand side, the meaning of that is uh, like this. So this is a conditional probability, right? The conditional probability that you need an extra flips. And on the right hand side, it is an unconditional probability. It seems that it's just a, you from the very beginning, what is the probability that you need more than n flips and you will see the first to has, right? The left hand side means that you already have n tails. But the probability that you need n additional flips will be the same as the very beginning. You need more than n flips and you see first to has. Why is called memorlessness? It means that you have no memory of the history Right? You already flipped n times. But this will not teach you to know more about what will happen in the future. So each time you have, you see tails, you just start from new. You just start like you just start from the very beginning. Right? So that 
that's why it's called a normal white space. And actually, it's a, this makes sense. Because each time, you just flip the same coin. And whether, whether what happened in the past, it will not affect what will happen in the future. The coin is the same. And you cannot control. And you, you, you cannot learn from the past results. So then, it must make sense, right? Because that's the, the nature of this game. And actually, so, so that's why it is called memorlessness. It means, again, it means that what happened in the past will not help you to know more so about the future. So this is the nature of this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this experiment. And actually, if you think of this, if we go back to Chad, this uh, old example, so you may realize that actually this example may not be may, may not be very realistic because uh, this example is uh, is modeled as uh, as a geometric distribution. So each time when I take this uh, driving test, the probability that I pass that test will be the same. It's just like uh, each time you double flip a coin, right? So. If I have uh, failed a lot of times, it seems that I haven't learned anything from my experience. So, so it seems that I'm just a, a dumb guy, right? So this is a, so that that's why I said this example may be not too realistic. So, and actually, so we can prove that among all discrete distributions. Geometric distribution is the only distribution that has this uh, memorlessness property. So, which means that as long as you can show something like this, so this left hand side is equal to the right hand side, you need to immediately realize that. So, it's talking about a game of flipping a coin, right? So. What happened in the past, no matter how many times you see tails, it won't increase or decrease the chance you will get heads next time, right? So then, if it has such a property, then, so this, this random experiment must have the same nature as flipping a coin. So this is why this memorlessness is so important because it's simple and uh, the geometric distribution is the only discrete distribution that has this property. And later, so when we introduce a, a continuous distribution, there's also a continuous distribution that has this uh, property, so which is called exponential distribution. And this is the only continuous distribution that has this uh, property. Uh, we will uh, we will explain that later. So this is the uh, geometric distribution. And next, let's uh, let's uh, let's introduce a, a binomial distribution. So what is the binomial distribution? So here uh, we have uh, n iid for newly run variables. We call them x1, x2, up to xn. So, what is IID? So, recall that IID means independent, identically distributed, right? Independent means, so, all those n random variables have nothing to do with each other. So, no matter what value x1 takes, whether it's 1 or 0, it won't affect the value other guys would take. Right? So, and then we just sum all those guys up together. x1 plus x2 after xn, so the sum is called y. And this y, the sum of n for newly random variables, is called a binomial random variable. So, how do I understand this? So, each x x1, x2, so each one is for newly random variables. So, which means that we flip a coin. 
So if is has is one, if is tails is zero. Right? We flip it n times. We add them together. Each time, if is has is one, otherwise is zero. Right? So if we add them together, then this y actually is just a, the number of has we have among the n flips. Right? So again, so let's 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 think of this. What is y? Y is just a number of flips of has. Number of has among m flips. Right? It is called a binomial random variable. So what is the probability mass function of a binomial random variable? So here you can see that because uh, it's a number of has and we have we flip it totally uh, n times. So the number of has could be zero, could be one, up to n. So it could take n plus one different values. The probability that the number of has is equal to k is just like this. We have n flips, k of them a has. So we have uh, n choose k choices, right? And for each choice, so because we have k has, the probability would be p to the power k. And the other n minus k flips are all tails. The probability of that is should be 1 minus p to the power n minus k, right? So that's the, that's the probability mass function. And actually, so this is a, uh, we explained so, so this example in the past, too, right? So that's a, that's the theory test example. So we have, uh, I need to answer 25 questions, and for each question, I can give the right answer with probability P, right? So then, what is the probability that I answer K questions correctly? So just uh, follow something like this, like, we explained that uh, weeks ago. And uh, so this is the probability mass function of uh, binomial distribution. And uh, so let's see, what is the expected value of, uh, of uh, uh, a binomial random variable? So of course, we can, we can follow the, the, the definition. Uh, we can follow the definition of uh, expected value to calculate that using the probability mass function, but it doesn't seem to be easy, right? And actually, so because uh, because uh, a binomial random variable is just a sum of a bunch of uh, familiar random variables, we can use the property of uh, uh, expected values to calculate that. So if we wish to calculate the expected value of y, which is the binomial random variable, we know that this y is just a sum of uh, families, right? A sum of families. And by using the linearity property of uh, expected value, so we just need to, so this uh, expectation of the sum is equal to the sum of expected values. So we just need to calculate each individual uh, random variable and sum them up together. For each one, each one is just a Bernoulli. What is the expected value of a Bernoulli, which is equal to P, right? So we see that the expected value of this uh, binomial random variable must be equal to n times p. So, so this is uh, pretty simple. And also, what is the variance? The variance of y, because y is equal to the, the sum, the variance of the sum. And because uh, all those Bernoulli's are independent, we know the property of uh, variance. The variance of uh, independent random variables is equal to the sum of their respective variances, right? So then the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of their variances. For each one, because it is just a Bernoulli random variable, the variance of that is just a p times 1 minus p. 
So the variance of the binomial is equal to NP times 1 XP, right? So which is, uh, so this is, uh, uh, I think, pretty simple. So maybe let's, uh, let's see an example of this uh, uh, binomial distribution like this. So in this uh, uh, exercise example, so we consider we consider the color of one's eyes. So we know that uh, the color of a person's eyes is determined by a single pair of genes. So with the gene for one eyes being dominant over the one for blue eyes, right? So the, the gene could be brown gene or blue gene. If you have two brown genes, then the color of your eyes will be brown. If you have two blue genes, the color will be blue. If you have one blue, one brown, and this brown is dominant, then the color of your eyes will be brown, right? That's uh, biology. So then, uh, so we know that, so, each of us have a pair of genes, one from mom, one from, from dad, right? My mom could have a brown or a blue, my dad could have a brown or blue. So that's the, the mechanism. So now let's consider uh, a couple. So, so this couple, both of them have brown eyes. And uh, the eldest child of this couple has blue eyes. So then, what does it mean? So, suppose that is a, this, this child is, is, is not adopted. It's not adopted if, uh, if he has uh, blue eyes, which means that he must have two blue genes, right? But one gene from mom, one gene from dad. So mom must have at least one blue gene. Dad must have one blue gene, right? But both mom and dad have brown eyes. Means they have one brown and one blue, right? Both of them should be like this. In this case, you can see that the probability of uh, a child of this uh, couple having blue eyes would be one half times one half, which is one quarter. So with one quarter, this a child should have uh, blue eyes. And with probability three quarters, the child should have brown eyes, right? So then the question is, what is the probability that exactly two of the four other children have blue eyes? They have totally five. The first one have blue eyes. What is the probability that two of the other four have blue eyes, right? So we have analyzed this, uh, this problem, actually, the rest of the thing is just to plug in the PMF of uh, binomial distribution, right? So here, <coughs> as I explained just now, so because the eldest child has blue eyes, both parents must have one blue and one brown genes, right? And then in this case, the probability that an offspring has brown eyes would be one quarter. And because uh, for the other four children, so the probability that uh, one of them, each of them have brown blue eyes should be one quarter. Then the probability that exactly two out of four have brown blue eyes would be four choose two. That's the number of choices times one quarter to the power two, one quarter square, which is the probability that. 
people, two kids, two children, and who us. And this three quarter will be the probability of a child having a brown eyes, right? Because the other two have brown eyes, so it's just this probability. Then we just uh, plug in those numbers, so the, the final result is 20, 23 over uh, 100 and uh, 28. So that, that is this. So, so this is about the uh, binomial distribution. And let's see, uh, binomial distribution actually has two parameters. The first is n, the number of flips. The other parameter is p, the probability of hats, right? And again, what is a binomial? So it's uh, the number of hats among n flips. So because uh, it has two parameters, actually, um, the PMF of that is uh, is a, a bit complex. So you see, so both P and N will affect the PMF. So I show you some pictures of the PMFs. So in the first picture, it is the PMF for P is equal to uh, 0.1 and N is equal to 10. And also, so that, that's the blue dots. Those green dots is the P is equal to 0.1 and N is equal to 20, right? So you see, even if the P is the same, so the distribution looks uh, pretty different, at least for the first few points, right? And in the <coughs> second, in the, in the, in the second uh, picture, so P is equal to 5, uh, 0.5. N is equal to either 10 or 20. So you see the, the shape of them is also different. At least, uh, so you see the, the center of them will be a little different. And also, in the, in the third picture, they also have the same P, which is uh, 0.9 with different ends. So you see uh, they also look very a bit different. Like at least the position will be very different. So here, you see that it's, uh, it may not be easy to to quantify, uh, to compare to those, uh, uh, the distribution of binomial when we just fix one parameter and change another parameter. So we just, uh, we just wish to show you that both parameters will play a role uh, to determine the, the distribution of a binomial from the verbal, so which is the case. So, mm. uh, any questions? So if no questions, I think that's it for uh, today's lecture. And uh, see you next week. <laughs>